The Lord be with you. Let us pray together the colic of the day. O oh God, because without you we are not able to please you, mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated as we hear the reading of the scriptures. The first reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 49, verses 8 to 13. Please turn your pew Bibles to page 634. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 8. Thus says the Lord, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages, that you may say to the prisoners, Go forth. To those who are in darkness, show yourself. They shall feed along the roads, and their pastures shall be on all desolate heights. They shall neither hunger nor thirst, neither heat nor sun shall strike them. For he who has mercy on them will lead them. Even by the springs of water he will guide them. I will make each of my mountains a road, and my highway shall be elevated. Surely these shall come from afar. Look those from the north and the west, and these from the land of Sinem. Sing, O heavens, be joyful, O earth, and break out in singing, O mountains, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have mercy on his afflicted. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading for today is taken from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Please turn your pew Bibles to page 1017. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, 
being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If we are asked to fill in the blanks, love is a blank. Perhaps love is a commitment, love is a feeling, love is a responsibility. But our anthem today answers the question by saying, love is a man, and love is spelled J-E-S-U-S, -S, which is our Lord Jesus Christ. We shall now have the anthem entitled, Love is a Man.
Let us all stand for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is taken from Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 22. Jesus rejected at Nazareth. Verse 16, So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed over the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which was preceded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. And we are glad to have with us this morning to preach God's Word, Pastor Jonathan Benzuelo. So we give the rest of the time to him. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, good morning. Now, have you seen what happened to uh, Tito, Vic, and Joey lately? Now, I'm not going to preach about it bulaga. Uh, it so happened that when I was uh, watching some of those issues or controversies in YouTube, there are recommended videos. And uh, one of those recommended videos was basically an interview for uh, Tito Sen some years ago during the election season. So this is not politicking since it happened many years ago. And uh, he was asked, if, you were, uh, if you're going to be elected as the new president of the Philippines, what will be your model for leadership? And I was quite surprised uh, as to his answer. He said, if I'm elected as the new president of the Philippines, I will use the model of servant leadership. Now, why did that surprise me? That model of leadership can be found in the Bible, and definitely it came from the example of Jesus Christ himself. <clears throat> but when you talk about servant leadership, you cannot practice it, you cannot do it without the major element of humility. Now, it's not only through leadership, but in everyday Christian living. In order for us to truly follow the pattern of Christ, as related by the scriptures that we have read, Isaiah, Luke, and even Paul, that humility is indeed something that Christ has emulated, Christ has lived out, and for us, we learn from it, and it is also something that we apply. But then, when we talk about humility, we need to understand what humility is uh, in connection to God's Word. Because there are times we seem to assume a humility is based on other stuff. For example, do you think that a person who is quiet is automatically humble? No. Maybe the person is not talking, he is silent, but the heart of the person may not necessarily look at others with importance and not submitted to the will of God. So silence is not automatically a manifestation of humility. If a person always bows down and tells you good morning, good afternoon, good evening, <clears throat> is that person automatically humble? Well, that person is polite. Maybe he's practicing good manners and right conduct. It may be part of habit. But if the person uh, is not truly humble at heart, it's only something that is being shown outwardly but not necessarily an attitude of the person. Maybe that person is only showing a glimpse of what we can call humility, but not in totality. In Christianity, as you look at Scripture, it has to be part of your nature, meaning it has to be part of our Christian lifestyle. 
So, what is humility when it comes to Scripture? Uh, two things. The first one, we talk about the principle of humility. <clears throat> when we talk about the principle of humility, we, uh, I would like to uh, give you the uh, thought coming from Tom Holliday. He has a book, The Relationship Principles of Jesus, and he has a line there that encapsulates what humility is if we look at Scripture. The first one, he says, it is being at your best. Maybe some of you, your eyebrows are raised and saying, humility, being at your best, isn't being at your best actually being proud? Not necessarily so. Being at your best simply means you know what God has actually placed in your life as a potential, talent, skills, abilities, what have you. And then you would like to use that to the best of your abilities. Because one Christian principle, a biblical principle, cannot contradict the other. In humility, we cannot actually push aside good stewardship. Well, when it comes to a line, let me clarify this point. For example, there's a line. I'm in front of the line. And there's a person at the back, and I would like that person probably more disadvantaged than me. To be in front of the line, that's okay. No problem. But if this is a classroom setting, and for example, no? see, uh, uh, Reverend Justin is the most intelligent in the class. He's the first honor. Then he decides, Pastor Jay is always third. I'm not going to study hard anymore so that Pastor Jay can become number two or at least number one. I will settle for being number five. Do you think that's humility? In some cases, when we talk about human understanding of humility, that might be deemed as humility. But that is mediocrity in Christianity. You're not living up to the standards that were actually given to you. And what else? This is not good stewardship. If you are number one, be number one. If you are the best, be at your best. And what is given by God to you, make use of that to the optimum. But this is the second part. But have the heart to serve. So the two principles, humility and stewardship, do not contradict. And what else? If you're actually giving your best to the Lord, and now you're challenged by God to be used for His glory, and you're going to allow Him to make use of your life, the quality of service that you will be able to provide is also optimum. But if you're not using your talents, gifts, and abilities to the maximum, and you will be serving, the kind of service that you will be given, uh, giving is also actually low quality. You understand now the point? So the principle of humility in totality, be at your best, but have the heart to serve. Now, we have a model for that. When we look at how Luke presented it in the Gospel of Luke, he wrote about the beginnings of Christ. He talked about Christ taking on human form, talked about Jesus in that Gospel, serving. We, why does he have to write all these things, even the coming of Jesus in a life of simplicity? To show us the principle. And what is the principle? What we have gotten was the best. Now, look at the structure here. When we talk about the picture of how Jesus applied this, it is always stated in Scripture, He that came from above. What does that mean? Well, the origin of Christ is divine. And the kind of life that we were given is perfect and holy. He made a decision to come down here on earth and to live among us and to set aside His Godhood and to serve. Why did he have to emphasize that? Why does the scripture, the authors, have to emphasize that? To show us. You can never accuse of Jesus of giving you what is <clears throat> rubbish or that you're short-handed. You're not giving, given the best. Actually, when you were given something, you were given the best. God gave you the best. He came from a divine origin. The quality of his life is way up there but he was willing to come down here to live among us and to give himself for us. That is the picture of humility. And that's not just a model for us to look at. It is actually something that we should also practice. Maybe you're saying, I cannot be like God. No, it is not about being perfect. I cannot be perfect on earth. I cannot be God. I'm just a created being. But as a follower of Christ, this is exactly what we're being taught. The best that you have, surrender it for God's use and your life willfully used by God for other people, for His glory. This is the, this is the picture. Now, if uh, we look at the first two verses of Philippians chapter 2, as has been read to us earlier by Pastor Harold, we can see what Apostle Paul uh, <clears throat> intends here. Uh, you know, 
I'm going to make a comparison between two congregations. One is of Corinth, the other one is of Philippi. When he was uh, writing to the Philippian believers, he was quite uh, anyway, uh, happy uh, because he was seeing that the principles of Scripture, they were applying in everyday life. And that has helped improve their Christian life and their uh, relationship with one another. Uh, the truth is, when you look at this passage, it does not mean that the Philippian congregation does not have a problem. They also had problems. No? That's why if you go to chapter 3, especially chapter 4, you will be reading that there are even two people there mentioned, Judea and Syntyche, that were at conflict with each other. But Paul is saying, if you read the, the 11 verses as has been read to us, what you find is that there's an improvement despite the conflict, despite the limitations, despite of the shortcomings of people. If you apply the, apply the principles of Scripture, it upgrades the situation. It improves it. On the contrary, look at the Corinthian congregation. Many of them are having a hard time applying the principles of Christ. And so what happened? You know 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you read verses 4 to 7, usually we use that for engagement ceremonies. We use that for weddings. But in fact, it's not romantic love. It can be used for romantic relationships. It has something to do with the coming together of a congregation that always has conflicts. And what is at the center of conflict? Pride and boasting. That's why if you read 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it is not proud, and it is not boasting. Why would he have to say that? Because that congregation, they seem to think that being proud and boasting is okay. That's part of their culture. Uh, the Gentiles usually have that. They are a uh, group of people who were taught that you have to be, what, flaunting everything. They are the ones who live uh, in connection to personal pleasure. It can be selfish at times. And not only that, they existed at the time when the Greek games were definitely part of their everyday culture. And so they will side with people. They will brag about their champions. But the problem is they were actually bringing that part of their culture into the church. Paul was trying to tell them that's not the way to go. If you want to live the Christian life, you abandon certain things as part of human innovation and culture. Why? Because it's going to create divisions in the body of Christ. What is pride? Pride is the desire to be there on top so that others will envy you. That's the intention of pride. And what is boasting? Now that I am on top, I can belittle others. That's boasting. And Paul is saying that cannot be in the Christian life. How do you solve that problem? Well, the element of humility is put in to control that human tendency because we're all prone to that. So now let's look at how do we do that. Well, Paul says we have to have uh, first the mindset of Christ. Uh, when we talk about the mindset of Christ, why does he start with the uh, thinking or the thoughts of humans? Well, experts are saying that your mind is the control center of your life. So it's very important that we understand why Jesus allowed himself to be known as the truth. He is the truth that will set us free. His teachings, his life model, once it is there, part of our lives, then that's the only time that we can apply the principles and live a life that's following his footsteps. That, so definitely it has to have an effect in our thinking system. Look at what Paul wrote in Romans 12 too. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to know God's will, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. You cannot be able to discern, nor follow, or emulate the will of the Lord if your mind is not surrendered to Jesus. So in the case of humility, it's the same thing. So what is the mindset of Christ? Do nothing out of selfish ambition. Now let's clarify. In Christianity, it is not wrong to have dreams, goals, and ambitions. It's okay. Because how can you tell the Lord, Lord, take care of my dreams, uh, help me fulfill my goals, if you don't have any? Even in Proverbs, it is stated, without vision, people will perish. So having ambitions, dreams, goals, you submit it to the Lord. That's how you go about it in Christianity. But you have to have them. That's part of how the Lord designed our lives. But do not be selfish. That's the main issue. Now, 
when we talk about uh, uh, the life of Jesus Christ. Remember, when we talk about humility, it is not about abuse. You know? Sometimes people seem to uh, think that if I'm living a humble life, I'm going to be abused. No. In abuse, a dominant force is coercing you to do something you don't want, so you don't have a choice. In humility, you have a choice. In the case of Christ, He could have opted not to come here. He could have opted not to give His life for you and me. He has an option. He has a choice. But He made a decision to actually give Himself to you and me. That's the mindset of Christ. So, if we have ambitions, it should not be selfish. Second, value others above yourselves. Now, I know St. Stephen's, you love basketball, right? <clears throat> How many of you rooted for the Denver Nuggets uh, this past uh, uh, NBA Finals? Walang Denver Nuggets. Yeah, so many of you are Miami Heat fans. Condolence. <laughs> the thing is, if you look at the Denver Nuggets, I've been watching the uh, profile of their center, Nikola Jokic. I'm not saying he's actually... Uh, a representation of Jesus or whatever blasphemous things that can be stated here. No, I'm just saying, look at humility. Even if practically applied in any aspect of life, it changes the dynamics of the situation. We know that in uh, American basketball, usually if you have the uh, playing skills, the abilities, the tendency is to be proud. And of course now, they're trying to modify their game. They want it to become team effort because back then, if you're the best player, the highest paid player, usually everything is centered around you, not only in the marketing but also the gameplay. But look at Nikola Jokic. According to many experts, he could have scored 50 points and above every game. That's his potential as a player. But instead, he would rather score in uh, about 30s or so because he would like to maximize other parts of his statistics. Uh, Part of that, of course, is his rebounds, double digits. And the part of that uh, is also his assists, double digits. Now, why is he doing that? Because it's a team sport. He could demand the ball always, have many misses, and allow his teammates to just pick up the ball and pass it back to him. But he opts to pass the ball. Not only there. One time he was interviewed because he was not given the 2023 MVP. So he was asked, I think the one who asked wanted controversy. So what can you say about Joel Embiid? He said, I played with him. He's a very good player. End of story. He does not want to create controversy. He recognizes the uh, abilities of other people. And every time he's asked uh, about his contribution to the team, he would always refer to the coach and to the other players and not himself. That's why most of the time, the reporters will be asking other players about Nikola Jokic. Uh, uh, Gordon, one of his teammates, was asked, what can you say about him? The answer of, uh, of uh, uh, when Gordon was asked about Nikola Jokic, this is uh, how he described Jokic in the team. He makes us look good. Because he keeps passing the ball, we can score, and the whole team feels, feels good about their being together. And that's it. You know? uh, being proud, there are players that can score 50, 70 in a game. Pill it. The ending... Uh, they fail to win, especially the other games. And not only that, the, uh, the, team, uh, the, the teammates are not confident and not, they're not cooperating with each other. It's every man for himself. On the other hand, since it's a team sport, even if the best player can score so much, but he balances his statistics by being good also in other aspects, now you will see the team with high morale. So again, this is just an illustration in one field, and there are other fields wherein when you practice humility, the cohesion of the, of the people involved becomes different. And that's the whole point of Christ. Humility is not only a spiritual principle. Applied in human context, it changes the dynamics of our interaction. And the third, express concern for the interest of others. This is exactly why we have the cross. Uh, the sacrifice of Jesus cost our salvation. He was not thinking about his interests. He was thinking about ours. When he died, we got saved. And it was his suffering and his death that gave us that opportunity, that gave us that privilege. Now, let's evaluate. Am I humble or not? You know, humility is one of those uh, uh, Christian values that is hard to, uh, to declare. 
Why? Once you say, I'm humble, now people will think you're proud. I have a classmate in Bible college in our seniors retreat. Uh, he's the class comedian, by the way. So most of the time, he'll just uh, make us laugh. But in that retreat, suddenly he was very serious. And this is what he said. In his introduction to all of us in the group, he said, please don't envy me when we graduate because I will probably be the most popular in our class uh, when I publish this book. I have thought about a title and I think it will be a bestseller. So all of us were in awe. We're thinking he, this guy has already thought it out, how he will be propelled to fame and uh, in a few years' time, according to him. And not only that, he was actually claiming that he will be that prominent. Then when we asked, so what's the title of the book? He said, how to be humble like me. Then he started to laugh. <laughs> so he was able to fool us. <laughs> uh, but the truth is, it's really hard to claim whether you're humble or not. But you have to gauge it, right? You have to have a checklist to know, am I humble or not? So there are four steps for you to be able to know. Are you really following the footsteps of Christ? And are you really living out Christian humility? Again, I'm trying to distinguish. Uh, humility in Christianity from the Bible's perspective may be different from the world sees humility. Okay? So let's look at the first one. Step number one is sacrifice. Look at Philippians 2, 5 to 6. Uh, you can find there that Christ, even though he had the nature of God, set aside his godhood. It was his choice. So what is sacrifice? Sacrifice is your willingness to set aside your own comfort so that when you do something, it will be for the advantage, probably the comfort or benefit of others. That's sacrifice. You know, every first Saturday, I help some policemen, that cadets and officers at that. And I was uh, telling them, uh, very important, if you want to serve God, country, and fellow men, you have to have humility. Why? Because you people, and I was referring to them, you will have empowerment. You will be holding weapons. You will have that privilege in society. You will be given ranks. And you will be given positions in, our, in your organization that you can take control of the public. If there's no humility, it's hard to truly serve anyone. Now, I gave them two illustrations about policemen I've seen in YouTube. One was in the U.S. You know, mass shooting in the U.S. is so rampant, they also call it an epidemic. There was one story of a policeman. He was supposed to be off duty at the parking lot of a mall. Then he heard gunshots, people running out of the mall. What would cause a person off duty at that? To go into the mall, engage the shooter, and probably put himself in harm's way so that he can save others. That's sacrifice. That guy was given a medal. In the Philippines, a YouTube video also uh, of how a police officer also uh, <clears throat> off duty. He was fixing his motorcycle in front of a convenience store when he noticed there was somebody uh, robbing that particular store. Went inside, engaged the hold upper. What happened was they had a shootout, both of them died. He was given a flag. What would cause a person, you might be thinking that guy is foolish. Why would he risk his life to save others? But that's his call of duty. He was serious in that. But remember, the only way for you to truly enact sacrifice is for you to give up your own benefit and comfort so that the, uh, the purposes of others will be served and to give glory to Christ. You cannot be humble without sacrifice. Now, the second. The second step is about servanthood. Uh, when we look at verse 7, that's exactly what is being pointed out there. Now, what is servanthood? One behaviorist put it this way. People, we might be willing to serve a group, but all of them is because they will give us something in return. Now, let me uh, show you the list. I'll just be mentioning three. The first one, we most likely will be willing to serve somebody who is in power. I was telling the uh, uh, police officers one time when I was talking to them, how many of you had more friends when you became promoted as officers? Why? Because everybody wants their number or their all-powerful calling card. For what reason? So that when you uh, commit a traffic violation, instead of actually trying to face up to the ticket, uh, paying it or uh, uh, being charged with it because you violated the traffic rule, everybody would practically pull out the calling card 
or call the officer who most likely would be sleeping or is in duty had to be disturbed because of your violation. That's why in the Philippines, nobody is wrong. Everybody has a friend. So you dial a friend. <laughs> you see the problem? We want to serve a person in position, in power, because we would like to take advantage of we, we name drop in the Philippines. We call it the Padrino system. But that's a problem. Second, when we talk about persons who are popular, we would like to serve them. Why? Because their popularity gets rub off, rub, it rubs off on us. Uh, in our church, there was a young girl after the service suddenly shrieking, somebody's following me. But it was not a shriek or a scream of, ano, ah, of fear. Dati kasi somebody's following me, we're thinking stalking. This time, I think it's Instagram. Well, the only social media I have is Facebook. I didn't understand it first. So I was asking, so why are you happy somebody's following you? It intrigued me. Well, Pastor, if, because this is a popular person, I might get noticed by others. You want to serve somebody who's popular because when that, once that person notices you, other people will notice you. It empowers you. Or we want to serve people with money because as we do that, maybe there will be a return for us. I'm not saying that these categories are technically or automatically bad. What I'm saying is we're only uh, most of the time willing to serve people who can give us something in return. Look at the servanthood of Christ. Look at the Gospel of Luke. Most of the time, as he documented the ministry of Jesus, everybody he has actually served does not have the capacity to pay him back or do anything in return, to give him in return. So the thing is, why would he do that? That's servanthood. You see their disadvantage, and you would like to cater to it, and that's the kind of servanthood of Jesus. Your salvation, can we repay him? Of course not. The life he gave to us is of the best quality. The life I have is that of a sinner. He gave his life, and that's why I can be saved. I cannot repay him. When Christ healed the ten lepers, it's an issue with other people. Didn't he know that nine of them won't come back to say thank you? He knows. But why would he heal them? They're ungrateful people because they're sick, and he has the capacity to heal them, and he wants to heal them at that moment. It's not about them saying thank you. This is God's kind of servanthood. It's not because of the repayment you get. So in that checklist, look at servanthood. And there's a third. It's called submission. Submission is very important. Now, experts are also saying that we have three kinds of problems that we have to overcome. And I think humility can also help us with that particular aspect of our lives. Number one is called immaturity. How do you define immaturity? It is a person's inability to defer or to deny gratification. Look at the child. Now, Burmans na. Some of you would be going to the mall. There will be new toys there. Maybe the child would want a toy. And then if you don't give that uh, child the toy, the child will cry out or uh, make a scene or do tantrums. Reality of the matter. It's, only, it's not only children who has tantrums. Even adults do. So we need to mature. Second is insecurity. Why do we have this uh, universal notion of crab mentality in, Fili in the Philippines? Ang tawag natin, ugaling talangka. It's like this. Maybe when a person in his, uh, was in his original state of life, beneath you or equal with you, you're comfortable with that person. That person may even be your friend. But through perseverance, God's blessing, maybe that person will actually rise in status, maybe become richer than you, will be promoted in a higher position than you are. How would you react? There are those who don't like that. There's a stirring up. That person may not be doing something wrong, but you want to pull that person down. I'm also helping some companies whenever there are conflicts. In one particular conflict that I had to uh, be an arbiter, uh, it was the, the other person complaining that he was bad-mouthed by a former friend. You know, I asked him, what did he say? Pastor, I uh, purchased a bike, a motorcycle, and I have to pay it every month out of pocket. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm actually uh, buying this because I need it. I don't know what happened to my friend. When I had this bike, he suddenly changed. And he was in conversation with other people who asked him a basic question. Where did he get the money to buy this bike? You know what he placed there? It's actually a seed, which is a lie. And it was to ruin this person's reputation. He said, probably he's pushing drugs. 
Imagine the reputation of the guy will get affected. What happens if that person goes back to becoming beneath you or equal with you? That's the time you're comfortable and you're happy because you're saying that's your proper place. That's probably a manifestation of insecurity. Even though that person is not doing anything wrong, if you're stirring up within, your envy cannot be controlled. That can be also a picture that can happen in everyday relationships. Or maybe impulsivity. We're all prone to uh, being uh, rattled by negative emotions. It may be jealousy, it may be sadness, it may be anger, it may be a host of things. If we don't control it, it will resurface indefinitely. It will control our attitudes, our behavior. And that needs to be controlled. The Lord is telling us one of the means to be able to help us is actually uh, the truth and the practice of humility. It helps a lot in having control in our lives. Now, when we talk about submission, it's not only submission to people, it's submission to rules. You know, every Sunday, this is a reality that we can observe. Uh, here in the Philippines, we have traffic lights, but for some reason, we think it's only, only part of Christmas decorations. When Sunday comes, it's just blinking, nobody follows it. Now, this is a reality. If I don't observe the traffic rules, most of the time I'm not thinking about the welfare of the state. I'm not thinking about the welfare of others. I'm most likely thinking only about myself. That's my admission. I don't know about you. But most likely that is what happens. Now, uh, it was last January, we were in Sapporo. And uh, we were in a street. There, ha there is a pedestrian stop sign. I wanted to cross. There's no vehicle to my left, to my right, but there was a Japanese lady with us. So there were four of us, me, my wife, my daughter, and the Japanese lady. She was not crossing. It was uh, a snowy evening. It was very cold. The wind was blowing. And I'm thinking to myself, we will be home earlier if we just cross. In the Philippines, we call this waiting impracticality, right? But the pedestrian stop sign has a hand and it is in red. So, in consideration to the local, we stop. Then when it was green, she crossed, we crossed as well. You know, sometimes you don't want to do that. Yes, yeah, the Philippines, may mga signage tayo, ang cute, kulay pink. Have you ever passed by EDSA? Or the other places where they have these signages? Bawal tumawid, nakamamatay. The succeeding years, magbabago yan. Bawal tumawid, may namatay na. And then moving forward, more years, you will see there, bawal tumawit, marami nang namatay. Now, I, I'm telling you, when we don't want to submit to the rules, when we don't want to consider the situation of others, and we only want to think about our own welfare, we will violate these things. Why? We're not thinking about the good of others. We're thinking about what we want, and that's selfishness. How do we solve selfishness? Well, we have to practice humility, suffering. It's not easy because sometimes you will have inconveniences, but that's part of it. If you want the betterment of society, if you want to serve others, sometimes you have to willingly suffer, right? Uh, two months ago, I uh, spoke at a wedding. It's a mixed marriage. The American was the groom and the Filipina, the bride. I wanted to know if the the groom has uh, no, a sense of humor like the Filipinos. So I said, if you're going to get married after a few years, you would have given your wife three rings. And he was baffled, three rings. I said, before you, got, you, you get married, you, you gave her a ring. Yes, the engagement ring, she has one. During the ceremony, you will exchange rings. Yes, the wedding ring. What's the third? I'm not familiar with the third. Well, after spending so many years together, you will be giving each other supper ring. <laughs> Uh, like Filipinos, okay na, benta na, joke na yan sa atin. But uh, the thing is, when we talk about suffering sometimes, it's not because you want it, but when you look at the situation, how do we improve this? If the natural tendency is to put forward your own intention, interest, concerns, and needs, sometimes you pull back and you allow the others to go first, right? That's a little bit of suffering. There are times you will actually help. Helping will uh, take attention, time, and even resources from you. But by giving out, you're helping the cause, you're helping others, you're helping the greater good, you're giving glory to Christ. So very important. In this checklist, 
Are you able to follow the four steps? And if you're able to do that, then definitely there is humility being practiced in your life. Now let's conclude this. <clears throat> I was asked one time by a student at Phoebus, Sir, why did Christ have to come down here on earth and take on human form? I told, him, uh, I told him, I'm going to give you three answers. The first one, he has to represent us before the Father. Because he's going to take on the role of a high priest, according to the author to the Hebrews. A high priest needs to be with the people, needs to represent the people. So he had to take on human form to represent us in front of the Father. That's one. The second is the idea of empathy or sympathy. You cannot accuse Jesus of not understanding your life situation. He came here. He experienced what you have experienced. He suffered. He became hungry. He wept. He died. He bled. A lot of those things he experienced just like us. So when you come to him, you know he's familiar with your experience. But there's a third. When he came down here, he came down here in order for us to have a visual aid on how to practice uh, these things. How do we live out the Christian life? For example, I want to teach you basketball and all of you are beginners. You don't know what basketball is, what the drills are. Suddenly I shout, dribble the ball. You don't know what dribbling, dribbling is. Probably some of you will run out. Some of you will do jumping jacks. Some of you will go around this particular hall. And I'll be mad. That's not dribbling. But you don't know what dribbling is. First, I have to hold the ball and then dribble it to show you. To my left hand and then to my right hand. And then you know what dribbling is. So when I say dribble the ball, you can do it. The same thing with the Christian teachings. Christ came down here on earth to live as a human being in physical form. To tell us, even though we're here in a limited state, it is still possible to follow Christ. I may not be perfect, but I can obey. Right? I may not be perfect, but I can improve. But I need to have humility to be able to do that. And you know what? Christ showed us it is possible. So I do hope, brothers and sisters in Christ, this is something that we take to heart. It's not something we simply learn as a principle. It's something we need to also practice. God bless you and good morning. We praise God for what Christ has gone through for our salvation. And it is our joy and privilege to be like our Lord as we journey our life here on earth. Right now, let us stand together in response to the message that we have heard. Let us declare what we believe in by reciting the Nicene Creed. With boldness, let us declare, We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true begotten, not of one being with the Father. For Him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, He came down from heaven, conceived by the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us kneel together for the prayers of the people. Father, as we have heard from the message, truly may Christians all over the world, be like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind in our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Father, may we do nothing out of selfish ambition, 
may we value others above ourselves and express concerns for others' interests. It is our prayer that you grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for our full-time ministers in the church, not only for the Episcopal Church, but all over the world. We earnestly ask that you cultivate within us a humble and gentle heart as we shepherd your people. Even as shepherds, may we always be teachable, sincere, compassionate, and submissive to your word. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. Lord, we pray continually for our country. We pray that all government officials be more than leaders, but first and foremost, servant leaders, who considers others above themselves and so imitate our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Heavenly Father, we pray for divine discernment to know your will and divine willpower to walk in it. We admit that it can get hard to choose you over ourselves. So we ask for your grace and empowerment to always choose the divine and right path. Therefore, we ask that you give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Father, we pray for those who are sick, those who have fever, cough, or runny nose, maybe because of the weather or a change of temperature. We pray that you would heal them and relieve of any form of imbalance in our bodies. And also we pray for comfort to the bereaved. We pray for peace to the troubled and grace to the poor. We ask that you have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. We praise you, Lord, for your saints who have entered into joy. Church family, let us take this moment to remember our neighbor, our sisters and brothers in Christ, and pray for our own needs also and those of others. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will to Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. For the confession, let us be reminded of 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 to 9. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us now confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray you of your mercy. Forgive what we have been, amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Let's receive the mercy of our Lord. Almighty God, have mercy on you.
forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Let us remember that we have been made righteous by our Lord Jesus Christ, that we may be able to enter and come to the table of our Lord. Let us pray the prayer of humble access. Most merciful Lord, we do not trust in our own merits to come to your table, but in your boundless grace. You have invited us to come to the table of the kingdom of heaven. Help us to partake of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we may evermore live in him and he in us. Amen. Let us now stand for the peace. It is our Lord Jesus Christ who said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give you. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us exchange peace with our seatmates and also to those who are worshipping at the comforts of your home. We extend to you the peace of our Lord. Please be seated. We shall now have the offertory. If again, if you are in the side of the pew that the attendance booklet is placed, we ask that you pass it in your pew so that everyone can write your attendance on the attendance booklet. As the offerings are being collected, we will be singing hymn 107 entitled, I Am Coming, Lord. Let's all rise.
We now celebrate, starting with the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels, with archangels, and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Shall we now kneel and pray? Our holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us in your image. And when we fell into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature to live and die as one of us. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for all mankind to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. And so with thankfulness in our hearts and with boldness, we proclaim together to the world the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And we offer you these gifts, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in Him. But sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. The gifts of God for the people of God. 
Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving.
Let us now kneel and pray. Together shall we pray the post-communion prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us now receive the blessing. And I shall sing the song. Guan shong te so su tut lang igua e piang an po shu din e sim huai idiam. Ho din hiao tit kiang ai shong te kap ye shang kia la ne kiu zu ya so ki tok. Ko guan zuan ding e shong te shang pe shang kia shang ding su hok ho din tit kao yang wan. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father. The Son and the Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen. You may now be seated for some announcements. We have several announcements and we are very glad to inform everyone that right after the worship service, maybe most of us know that it is our community fair later. It will be at the St. Stephen's High School covered gym with a fair opening ceremony at 11 a.m. So you can have your lunch there, buy snacks, and of course other stuff as well. We would like to tell everyone that the way to enter St. Stephen's High School covered court would be here in the high school lobby or at the back door at this side. If you know UTM Hall, you're going to walk past it and then there's a small door there straight to the covered court. So at least there are two ways to enter the, the school premise through those two areas. But the main entrance would be in the high school lobby. Second, we would like to call on Mam Ma Sharon for an announcement for the choir concert. Good morning to all of you. And of course, I am Sharon Abisamis, the choir conductor of this church. And as part of the celebration of our 120 years of existence as a church, the choir will have a concert this coming October 15. 6 p.m. here at the main sanctuary. We will feature the great works of Antonio Vivaldi and John Ratter. So please don't miss it because rarely can you hear and see these great works of great musicians being performed. And plus, we will have a live 12-piece orchestra playing for our choir. So please come and join us in worshiping the Lord through this concert. Of course, the main feature of this concert is our parish uh, choir with special participation of our Children's Praise Club and also with St. Stephen High School Choir. We will also have a special uh, soloist guest, the wife of uh, Pastor Dan Kura. Miss Eileen Espinosa Cura. So please invite your friends, your whole family, and guests, and let us taste and see the goodness of our God as we hear and uh, as we hear and witness the musical gifts that the Lord has bestowed upon this church. Okay, Pubayon, let us fill this place with people and let us honor the Lord and offer Him this grandeur of praise. Thank you very much. See you all. Thank you, Ma'am Sharon. Also found in your programs is the form or you want to take it home so that you won't forget the details of our choir concert. Third announcement, 
tickets for our 120th anniversary lunch on November 5 at 800 per ticket is available after the worship service at the back of the sanctuary. Again, it's our 120th anniversary lunch on November 5. 800 pesos per ticket will be available after the worship service. Also, those who have ordered anniversary shirts, the blue one, you may get them at the back right after the worship service. Please look for Deacon Eileen and Sister Jewel. Those who have ordered your anniversary shirt right after the service, please look for Deacon Eileen or Sister Jewel. Last announcement, it is with sadness that we wish to announce the passing of our longtime member, Mr. Joseph Go. He passed away from heart problems while he was on a vacation in the, from the United States. He will be cremated today before bringing his remains back to the United States. Let us keep the, the family in our prayers in this time of grief. So hope to see you right after the service in our community fair. You may also invite your friends and family to come. We hope that our worship to the Lord has been pleasing and acceptable in His sight. Right now, we'll be singing our closing hymn. Hymn 156, entitled, "'Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus, Let Us All Stand."
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.